Well, good morning, Walden Church. It's so good to have you all back, to see you, and to see your smiling faces. And for those of you who are watching on YouTube, welcome. Welcome to Walden Church. My name is David. I'm the pastor here. Today, we're going to start a brand new thing. We're going to start a new series. Uh, and it's all kind of inspired from the C.S. Lewis quote that I had a few weeks ago, where he said, God wants a child's heart and a grown-up's head. And I wanted to discuss more of what that looks like. How do we approach the kingdom of God like a child? Because next week, we're going to start looking at some of Jesus' most harshest words that he had for his critics. And I thought, you know, let's start by looking at one of the most famous pictures of Jesus. Jesus with little children. There's that famous passage in Luke 18 where the Bible says they were bringing infants to him that Jesus might touch them. Because religious leaders, part of their duties was to bless little children. Jesus would have people bring him kids because they could see that he had power, that he had authority, and they were asking Jesus to lay hands on them, to send over the peace of God or to lay on them the shalom of God and to touch their children and bless them. This is something that rabbis would do. People who were close to God would send some of that closeness through their touch and lay that on their children. It says, now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Jesus says something very interesting here. He says that receiving the kingdom of God has something to do with or something similar with childlikeness. Not being childish, but perhaps there is something in a child or something a child could teach us about what the kingdom of God is like. What do you think? You think we could learn something from a child? I mean, back in Jesus' day, children were seen, not heard, right? But everywhere he goes, we see Jesus elevate people. Jesus brings people in from the fringe. He brings in people that are on the outside, and he gives them a voice. And here we see Jesus elevate children, all the way to the point of saying, no, 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 don't cast children aside. Rather, you should be like them if you want to obtain the kingdom. What do we think that means? I mean, have you ever looked at a child and asked, I wonder what they're thinking, right? What is a kid really thinking about? I mean, what goes through their brains? Playtime, video games, TV shows. I mean, what kind of candy they like the best? Why grass is green? I mean, sure, right? All that kid stuff. But what else? I mean, do you think kids are stressing out that they have to file their taxes on the 15th? Do you think they're worried about the state of health care in America? Do you think they're worried about their governor or their government? Or do you think any of those things take up even the top five places in their brain? Do you think kids spend their brain power thinking about COVID-19 or China or conspiracy theories or masks? Do you think they're even thinking about going back to school? In fact, how much time do you think kids worry about tomorrow? Or what happens next week? Or what happens next month? I think my kids leave all that worry to me. And they trust their parents to worry about tomorrow. Now, when I look at kids, when they play, or when they color, or when they're just vegging out, they are totally present in what they are doing. Kids are totally here. Kids are totally on today. 
Psalm 95 says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Children are fully present. What can we learn from children? Children are fully present. Psalm 95 says the only thing that God requires of us is today. And we see this in the teachings of Jesus too, don't we? Jesus teaches that we should be fully present in the here and now. God wants holistic followers, not divided followers. Last week we said we are a united people, right? We're not apart. And, and while the world might pull us in a million different directions, God invites us to be fully present here. Jesus teaches in Matthew 6, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the Sermon on the Mount. What does Jesus say? Worry doesn't work. Who, who, who should you leave the worry to? Your parent, right? God. Worry, worry doesn't do me any good. Stop worrying about tomorrow. Stop worrying about who is going to be president. Stop worrying about when the road is going to get fixed. Stop worrying about when the Wi-Fi is coming back on. Take each moment to live and breathe today. Be fully present. And perhaps when Jesus says, receive the kingdom of God like a child, he asks that we shed our stress and shed our worry and shed our mistrust. And we would just relax. Be in the today. Live today. Focus on today. But what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? What does Jesus say? God knows. God has the answers. What does he tell me to do? Seek first the kingdom of God. How do I receive the kingdom of God? Jesus says, like a child. When worry comes along and you read that tweet, you read that Facebook post, you read that blog post, you watch that news report on TV, you see people holding signs, you see people waving flags, people shouting, people getting mad, all of that, all of that takes up space in your head. All that information, all that supposed research that you're doing, all that study that you're doing, it's headspace. It's just renting your mind and it's distracting you from today. Don't let it. Because some of you, you are letting all of that own you. 
you can't think about anything else and you've taken your eye off of today. Don't let worry own you. Be fully present. Now, if your house is like my house, uh, you're spending a lot of time, extended time, with kids and grandkids. They're always around, right? They're always around. And sooner or later, especially if you go over to somebody else's house, um, some familiar things start happening. The adults talk around the table downstairs, and the kids are playing upstairs. And the adults are listening, you know, from time to time. Maybe a couple shouts, something falls over, but so far, it's okay. And, and then one kid starts crying, and then you're asking, is that my kid? Is that your kid? And you hear footsteps coming down the stairs, followed by a second set of footsteps. And then the parents, we become the judge. Because now we have two uh, tiny little trial lawyers that are now in the room, and they're each presenting their case. He hit me. He hit me first. Well, what did you do? What did you say? Was it on purpose? Okay, what should we do? Say you're sorry. I'm sorry. And then what? A miracle happens. Two sets of feet go back upstairs. Friends. Forgiven. Children can fully forgive. Children can fully forgive. Billy Graham said, man has two great spiritual needs. One is forgiveness. Matthew 18, Peter came up to Jesus and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. And Peter said, yeah, but what about the people that wrong us? What about the people that betray us? What about the people that turn their backs on us or spread rumors about us or question us? Jesus says, God's kingdom is about forgiveness. And nobody, I mean nobody, forgives better and more complete than a child. In the Greek, the word forgive, it means to send it away. Meaning when you forgive something, you send it away. You, you don't carry it anymore. You don't hold it anymore. See, sometimes we say we forgive, right? I forgive you. But we end up holding on to something. We hold it. We don't let it go. And we see somebody struggling, maybe. We see somebody in pain, and we try to help them. And we say to them, hey, here's my advice. Let it go right? Let it go. When we tell the children and we say, say you're sorry, it's literally like a brick of anxiety <laughs> falls to their feet and they can just walk away. Why can't we do that? Have you been wronged by somebody? Of course. Jesus says, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, we have to be childlike. We need to forgive and we need to send that hurt away. We don't keep thinking about yesterday and, and we don't worry about it and we don't let it take up headspace. We live in the present and we learn to fully forgive. We, we send it away and we live in the present. When we had Declan, our, our first kid, uh, his room, his first room was upstairs. And uh, so we had, a, we had a barricade, we had a gate, we had a baby gate on the staircase. Why did we do that? To keep him off the stairs, right? Well, I mean, why do, we, why, why do you need to do that? Why do you need to put up a gate? Um, because three-year-olds don't uh, sleep in. <laughs> Three-year-olds don't lazily uh, hang out in one spot. They don't just hang out on the couch. They don't just wistfully daydream. Three-year-olds are adventurous. 
right? Three-year-olds don't take time out for themselves and read the paper. <laughs> Three-year-olds don't start slow and just have their morning coffee. There's no time for that, right? Three-year-olds wake up and they're like, I'm up, let's go. Let's do something. I'm ready, whatever it is, let's go. A, a three-year-old is up and going, 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 going until they just crash, right? Their, their, their speedometer is like down and like full. That, that's it, they have, they have two modes, they have on and off. There is something in the core of a child that's like a motor when they wake up and they say, what am I gonna do today? I hope it's something new, right? They can't wait for something new. They explore, don't they? Staircase, okay, fireplace, all right, right? I mean, it's like, where does that go? I, you know, like, oh, look, a toilet. I mean, what happens if I pull a dog's tail? Hey, can I drive a car? Like, children have this sense of adventure. They have a sense of exploration. A child does not live in despair and hopelessness. A child does not wake up and think, ugh, it's Monday. Here we go again, another week, right? Children don't have that sense of been there, done that. Children don't wake up defeated. Children know the, they don't even know the difference between Monday and Saturday. A child looks for adventure. Ooh, a $20 toy, I'll play with it. Ooh, a cardboard box, I'll play with it. We get to color, yippee! I get to play outside, yippee! I get to eat peaches, yippee! Children are full of hope. Children are full of hope. You see, one of the largest things that's attacking you and me is that every day is gonna be the same and that history is going nowhere, that you can't make a difference. And as adults, we live in angst. What is that? It, it's, the, it's the dread and it's the worry that life is monotonous that life is always gonna be the same and that there's no meaning to life. It just is. You know, you're born, you pay your taxes, you die. You clock in, you eat a couple pizzas, you clock out. Life is a, life is a circle. But the Bible has a different story. In fact, the Bible begins with new. The Bible begins with a story of a man who woke up and something new came along, and he said, yeah, I'll do that. I'm down for that. Genesis 12 says, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now this story comes to us out of the history books of Mesopotamia, which is the cradle of life. What is life? Well, you're born, you get married, you have kids, you pay for college, they get married, they have kids, you downsize, you die. Everyone lives like that. Everyone lives in that bubble. We all live in that circle. You wake up, go to work, do the same thing in a different day, shuffle home, grab a beer from the fridge, yell at the TV, sleep in front of the TV, wake up, do it all again. Same stuff, different day. Same stuff, different day. Same stuff, different day, right? Abram wakes up and a voice says, Abram, do you wanna go outside? Do you wanna come out and play? And what does Abram say? Later, I'm gone, sure, sign me up, I got, I'm, I'm packed. He leaves the circle, he goes someplace new. He tries something new. Abram left normal behind. And God rewarded him. Verse 2, God says, I will make you a great nation. 
I will bless you and make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, just like the Lord told him. Abram went, right? This story in Genesis, we see a person step out. They step out of the loop. They step out of angst. They, they step out of anxiety and sameness and despair. A person left monotony and they tried something new. What does this story teach us? It teaches us that history is not written. History is not doomed to repeat itself. One person can break out and they can go places and they can do things and see things that are new. Abram doesn't stay in his father's land. He goes to a new calling, a new life. He goes in a new direction. This is one of the fundamental bedrock understandings that come out of Abram's story. History doesn't trap us. We are not doomed to repeat it. We can step out. You know, we're in summer right now. We're in a COVID-19 summer. And maybe in a previous summer, you know, we all look forward to going back to school. And right now, we don't know what to look forward to. It's been 120 days. What are we looking forward to? Seen any good movies lately? Every day, there's a new video posted to social media of someone just losing their cool, right? And they flip out. And we post their video to social media and we publicly shame them. Look at this wacko person who flipped out. Shame on us. Shame on us, because we are all, we are all just one step away from losing our cool at a Costco. That could be you or me, right? Everybody feels this way. We all feel locked. We all feel trapped. We all feel like we're in prison. When I went to my dad when I was eight years old, and I felt locked and trapped in my house, you know, it's summer, nothing to do. And go to my dad and say, I'm bored. You know what my dad would say? Go outside. That was it. That was his words of wisdom. Go outside. Why go outside? Try something new? get a new outlook, get a fresh perspective. To go outside, I would have to literally open a door. The story of scripture says change is possible. We can alter it. We can step outside of monotony. We can literally open a door to possibility. Bob Dylan said it's hard to speculate what tomorrow may bring. Why? Because tomorrow is not a copy of today. Jesus knew that. He wanted his disciples to know that. Jesus called his disciples to leave behind the same old thing and like Abram to step outside of the circle and try something new. Matthew 4 says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, and Andrew, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, how long do you think it took for them to leave their circle and to try something new? The Bible says, immediately. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, 
in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately they left the boat, and just like Abram, left their father and followed him. Adventure is the call of Jesus. The disciples were either all blue-collar workers or they're all unemployed roustabouts. Do you know how monotonous it would be to be a fisherman back then? So to follow Jesus is to enter into his kingdom living. And it's this call to walk in a new direction, to step outside the circle, to leave despair, to leave monotony, to leave sameness. We, we can do it. We can wake up and literally ask, is there something new today? Can following Jesus today break me out of the cycle of what is old and what is known? Jesus says, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Can I be fully present today? Can I, can I let go of worry today? Is there somebody that I need to forgive today? Can I take a chance? Can I take a risk? Can I take a step towards hope this morning? Have you ever told a child to draw you a picture? They just pick up crayons and start. And perhaps they don't even just draw one picture. They end up drawing two or three or four. This one's a dragon. This is my teacher. This is my family, right? But the colors are all wrong. The proportions are all wrong. What would the art critics say? P people in the world, you know, there's other people and they can draw way better. Do you think kids worry about any of that? We went to Olive Garden last week and they gave Dermot a coloring page and they gave him two crayons. They gave him green and orange. Do you know what he did? He made it work. He didn't complain. He was fully present and he didn't worry because kids love to draw. Kids love to create. Just like their father. Our father is a creator. And he didn't create because he had to. He created because he wanted to, because it was good, because it gave him pleasure. The book of Lamentations is a book that's supposed to be sad. It's lamenting, it's weeping. Lamentations three says, I am the man who has seen affliction. Verse four, he has made my flesh and my skin waste away. Verse 7, he has walled me about so that I cannot escape. Verse 10, he is a bear lying in wait for me. Verse 14, I have become the laughingstock of all people. Verse 16, he has made me grind my teeth on gravel. Do we feel like that right now? That's kind of how we all feel right now, right? We're just all one step away from losing our cool at a Costco. But watch this. Same chapter. Same author. Verse 21. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, and his mercies never come to an end. They are new every day morning. Hope. Hope is new. Love. Love is new. 
God is always doing something new. Every morning. That means every morning that we wake up, we have the opportunity to receive the kingdom of God and it's new. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for today, this moment. I want to be present in this moment right now. I don't want to think about where I'm going to lunch. I don't want to think about what I have to do after church. I don't want to think about chores or Monday or tax returns or voting. I don't want to think about any of that because I know that you've got it. I know that worry doesn't add a single minute to my life. I want to listen. I want to trust. I want to be fully present in this moment. And when you call me away from my net, when you call me away from my homeland, I don't want to hesitate. I will gladly drop everything and turn immediately and follow you all the days of my life. I want to learn to be fully present. I want to learn to forgive like a child. I want to learn to have a sense of adventure and hope and to wake up each day excited about joining you in something new. Lord, we want to build your kingdom. Your kingdom come on earth, just like it is in heaven. We want to build community. We want to build forgiveness. We want to foster love. We want to extend grace. We want to do all the things that Jesus taught us to do and commanded us to do, not with a sense of dread or drudgery or angst or worry or monotony, not with any fear that this day will be like tomorrow, but that each day, each morning, there is the possibility of new. And we're excited. I'm excited for tomorrow. I'm excited for Monday. I'm excited to join you in something new. Lord, thank you. Thank you for creating that childlike sense of wonder in me. And may I never lose it. Lord, be with us, walk with us, continue to heal us and bring us together, unite us. We thank you and we love you. Amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. As always, we remind you that uh, you can like this video, you can subscribe to this channel. You can also clip and copy the URL at the top, that little uh, web address, and you can post it to your uh, social media pages, or you can share this message with a friend who you think it might help. I love you guys. I can't wait to see you. See you soon. Bye.